так наша панель so we'll talk about algo trading today. It used to be a, a buzzword. So there was a lot of hype about algo trading. It's getting increasingly boring in the past years. It's a routing thing just like anything else. And there are not many exciting trends, but I hope we can find some new insights today. There are some topics we'd like to discuss. Uh, the first one is the banks versus non-bank liquidity providers. Stanislav, what's your take? Who's better? Well, I, I disagree with the way you put the, f the question. I disagree with the way you frame your question, and I disagree that it's getting increasingly bored. Again, we need to think in partnership terms, and in this way, it doesn't really matter who we work with. What's key are those me the metrics that uh, we like, and if they, are, the, if they are good enough, we're ready to work with them. We have the methodology um, in place, and we're ready to work with any provider. Uh, if we talk about competition rather than cooperation, we don't really care. We don't really worry about it. One of the key values for the bank is that the bank can be at the right place at the right time for the customer. EFX is not something which would allow you to win. It's not your, it's not your uh, competitive edge, really. There have been attempts by some global banks to get into the market. Everyone was worried. But you didn't lose anyone. We didn't lose anyone. If you lose customers, it means you didn't do your homework. As for the rejuvenation of the market, I believe this will add fresh blood and uh, this will definitely be an exciting time. This will help to, you know, kickstart the market. Very often we use practices like targeting your market share. And I think this is wrong. If you are loss-making, if you don't calculate your costs, that has to be punished. <coughs> and new competitive participants will eat the shares, eat into the shares of those who don't control the costs. Do you want to mention anyone? Maybe later. Maybe later I'll start uh, naming someone. Well, you always think that your competitor is loss-making. It can't give you such affordable, such appealing price. But that's not always true. Vadim, I know you work at the bank, but uh, OK. If you think still who has better liquidity, banks or non-banks, specialized liquidity providers, I agree with the previous speaker, with. Uh, Stanislav, that we don't really compete with non-bank LPs. We view them as providers for us, price providers. It doesn't really matter where we take the prices, from banks and non-banks. But sometimes only banks, and most of the time, banks can give us a good price for big volumes because many of the non-bank LPs are small entities and they cannot really keep the risk. They just recycle someone else's liquidity. And if you want to get a good price, like for 20 million US dollars, uh, dollar Russian ruble pair, you can't get it. You know, 20 million can be only quoted by a bank, even 10 million. Maybe at G10 the situation is different, but uh, at least for now, this uh, antagonism of banks versus non-banks, it's not really relevant for Russia. Maybe it's relevant f globally, but in Russia, the banks are the dominant player. I don't think it will change anytime soon. It might change if Russian banks had an easy access, Russian players had easy access to some, some of the London-based platforms Currently, it's pretty limited because it's different to get prime brokerage. There are some the 
services that are supposed to, supposed to help you to have a setup with small counterparties. But these uh, new services will not really help you when the credit check really happens in Moscow. If you want to get a quote from a non-bank in London for euro dollar, Moscow services will create such, such latency, so many delays that this quote will no longer be interesting for you. Thank you. You've made it really clear. Let's move on to another topic. The more the better. Oh, sorry. The more, uh, the further on we move on, the uh, more important it is to get into the clouds and um, in storage in terms of calculations. And I'd like to put the question to Gabriel. What's your take from your perspective? What choice should be made by the customers? Is it clouds versus their own in infrastructure allocation? Gabriel, over to you. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a very good question, and uh, good morning from London. Um, I would see them both as tools. They're both um, uh, very useful tools that perform a function for the services and capabilities that you're looking to uh, to achieve. Um, but if we rewind back and look look in the history of cloud, 10 years ago, uh, I worked for a company that, that offered cloud services. And when we went to visit customers, uh, it, when we discussed cloud, it was seen almost like a dirty word. Um, the customers saw cloud as a major security flaw. Um, legacy IT systems were set in their way, building uh, and purchasing expensive fixed term co-location and server infrastructure uh, globally. And, uh, and that was the way it was for, for decades. Uh, ownership and proximity to matching engines and community members, um, that was the de facto. And, um, you know, we fast forward in time and uh, maybe uh, the finance or capital market sector was not the first sector to uh, adopt uh, cloud services. But five years ago, we see capital markets slowly dip their, their toes into the water, uh, allowing for non-critical services to be put on the cloud, you know, HR functions, um, you know, uh, other distributed architectures um, that, that got them comfortable. And uh, IT yeah, started experimenting with unified cloud, unified communications, unified connectivity. Um, the buzzword started to uh, be adopted by major um, firms. The digital transformation was the, uh, the key topic at many of these, um, these events. And uh, uh, the trust started to, to build. Uh, because cloud has got a unique perspective, a unique functionality. Um, we heard about uh, deep mind learning and AI and big data. You know, these are these are all services or tools or functions that the cloud is uniquely adopted to be able to provide. And uh, the ability to expand, uh, the ability to constrict on demand, elastic compute, elastic storage requirements, the ability to spin up virtual machines in hours in any geography uh, for any storage requirements. Uh, the ability to interconnect different geographical zones uh, via public or private cloud, depending on your um, security needs. And, uh, and all of this in flexible contract terms. Uh, you know, <laughs> rewind back. Previously, you would have to have been fixed for 12-month contracts. You'd be able to fix for your vendor of choice for server and hardware. And there was little in terms of flexibility. Um, so... I, I'm, I'm bigging up the, uh, the capabilities and use cases for, for cloud. And I do see cloud as being a unique uh, service or tool for, for AI, big data learning. That being said, uh, from my position, I see that uh, proximity to market data continues to be the critical importance in the electronic and algorithmic trading space. Um, the, the value of data proximity um, is something that hasn't been replicated by the distributed landscape. So uh, as, as great as, as cloud services are, the ability to get market data before your peers or, or before market participants um, continues to be what we see the, the biggest driver at Avelicom who specialize in low latency connectivity to markets, smart order routing, the ability to get market data quickly. So look, I would say that if you are a, um, you know, you're trying something new, you're trying to access a new market, a new asset, a new geography, and cost is quite sensitive. I would I would recommend going with with cloud. Cloud is quite you know a good service right now. Um, if you're looking to you know, 
formalize or, or improve on um, your existing trading services or trading um, uh, system, then I would definitely look to, to improve uh, market um, proximity. And co-location is, you know, it's tried and tested for many decades and continues to be the case. Thank you, Gabriel. And in continuation of the same question, uh, given the fact that um, the infrastructure uh, in recent years uh, has grown around e-trading and uh, algo trading, Vadim, what do you think? Uh, is it better to buy, to procure, or create uh, by yourselves uh, such infrastructure? Well, my opinion actually changed uh, in some uh, recent times, uh, which is probably driven by what we have in my company today. Uh, before, I thought that we should really outsource everything that uh, would not be our core business, uh, all those connectivity and any other infrastructure. And uh, what we need to keep in-house would be just a few algos uh, that are very essential uh, to our business. But now, with every passing year and month, that really share that I thought to be core really has grown uh, to really digest the connectivity and uh, any uh, position uh, management algos and everything. Which means uh, that today we are coming to an opposite model. Uh, it is uh, easier for us to hire people that would be really developing our in-house system rather than looking for vendors and uh, uh, that can provide such uh, outsourcing uh, uh, services. And uh, the conclusion there may be that uh, if you work in a bank which has uh, nothing today, you need to really take uh, um, um, something from the shelf, uh, like a boxed solution. But now, if even if you have something, then you probably would like to evolve that and develop that. Uh, Stanislav, what do you think? Indeed, uh, Anton was uh, right uh, when discussing this uh, in the previous uh, uh, session, that they tried to sweep and uh, uh, do the EFX, uh, but uh, you need also to have some understanding uh, uh, of uh, connectivity. You need to really uh, put right your connectivity, and uh, you also need uh, a good uh, pipeline. You have also need to have a good uh, storage, etc. And also, you need to hire people, people who would be able and capable to do something. In our company, we actually rebuild everything. We are hiring senior people from New York and London, because otherwise you cannot be competitive in the market. We don't have too many of those good experts locally. Or we hire some interns to train them. Well, this is a big thing to do, and uh, frankly speaking, for most of the participants, the best thing that you can do would be to really choose a liquidity provider and uh, use uh, uh, their uh, machines, uh, that, which is the simplest form of execution. Maybe can you share some experience as to how to use big data and uh, AI? Uh, any progress there? Well, indeed, uh, like I said, uh, ML and um, machine learning is uh, very important. You cannot be competitive without uh, ML today. But many think that ML is uh, like uh, big data in the context of big exchanges, etc. Well, true. This is something that people are already used to, and uh, this is a thing that has been discussed for quite some time now. But we try to use ML for non-liquid markets. Uh, we try to do something uh, uh, new there, and our success really may prompt people to uh, follow the suit and uh, use uh, ML. But what were your successes? Well. Currently, we're uh, 
quoting as uh, local banks, and we can compete with the local banks, and uh, we are much better than uh, any uh, Russian uh, participant. Uh, and this is uh, thanks to big data and uh, ML. Well, uh, KZT is uh, this uh, really quite difficult uh, uh, currency. Well, depending on what you want. If you want to enter the market and be uh, competitive there, then it is not an easy currency to do. Interestingly, interestingly, Gabriel. В принципе, вот вопрос, который хотел бы вам адресовать, у But that question uh, some time ago found a solution in the Russian market. This is about the channels of communication, like dedicated channels or using the Internet uh, for trading between different geographies. But maybe you have something new, uh, something interesting uh, there. Maybe you can share some thoughts about that. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, as we all know, the Internet is a re revolutionary tool, and it's how um, I'm speaking with you today. It's how we're all co collaborating on a daily basis. Um, internet speeds and infrastructure um, to support, uh, you know, the craving needs of uh, social media have all been met, and the cost per megabyte um, by service providers continues to drop at a wholesale level. Um, and, you know, large metropolitan cities are now adapting to the ability to serve Internet needs. Um, that being said, on a, a larger geographical perspective, uh, you know, internet infrastructure maybe isn't as, as good as all metropolitan regions. So you've got to factor in uh, aspects like packet loss, um, jitter, uh, latency, throughput, complications. Um, so this adds a layer of uh, undeterministic features. Now, now, this is the question you have to ask yourself, is, is uh, uh, are your models, uh, are your algorithmic systems uh, do they favor undeterministic features? And uh, and if the answer is no, then, um, you know, the, the idea might be to to steer away from, from the internet for now. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to uh, reference the, the tool analogy, um, it's internet is, is growing, it's low cost, it's quick to market. And, uh, you know, it, we're seeing some customers uh, adopt it. We're seeing customers in the crypto space um, you know, use uh, internet services use cloud capabilities to access markets because that's where they're based. However, you know, if you're looking for deterministic data transmission, um, dedicated optical lines continues to be um, the, uh, the the option of choice. Um, you know, serving you with ultra low latency and network speeds, uh, high uh, ultra high throughput, uh, deterministic routing, which is very important because. Uh, you know, dedicated lines can flip if there is a cut in the line, then it would revert onto the next available line. So you want to be able to control, you want to be able to see where your, your um, data is traveling. One of the things that Avela come offer are KMZ maps, which is a, a sort of a, a map that allows you to zoom into where the fiber is going and uh, gives you more confidence in, in knowing where your data is, is uh, transmitting between. Sort of think of like a, a you know, a, a rope that you pull at one end and it moves at the other end. It's a dedicated physical line. Um, so this is being seen as a uh, critical importance for, for all asset classes, for FX, for commodity trading, for equities trading, um, crypto trading space as well. I mentioned that uh, crypto, uh, uh, the, the asset class is most likely to, uh, to use internet as a, as a data access method, um, but more and more customers crypto trading customers are coming to Avelicom to use uh, Avelicom's private dedicated network between crypto exchanges. Um, so as the, um, you know, as things play out, uh, purpose-built fiber optic network continue to be um, the, the major uh, use case for accessing financial exchanges across uh, the Americas, across EMEA, across APAC. And um, if you're going to use dedicated lines, you have to spend some time to uh, analyze analyze your lines, analyze whether or not uh, uh, you are quicker than your competitors, understand what your latency is for accessing each of these markets. Um, speak to companies like Avelicom to um, provide latency figures of the RTD figures between all the exchanges. We have that data available. We can, we can offer that data. And you can compare that with your own data and see, uh, look, am, am I uh, up to date with my network infrastructure? Um, are my competitors accessing data, market data faster than I am? 
And it may be the case that you're spending the same amount of money for um, market data, network connectivity, smart order routing, than you would be with someone like Avelicom that can get you to the market quicker. And once you have that infrastructure in place, your algorithmic trading systems are now going to be using that latency advantage. In some cases, we're talking about milliseconds, uh, tens of milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, you know, huge amounts of difference um, for, 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 these, um, for these computers to be able to um, computate and, and receive and you know, instruct on your algorithmic trading systems on, on what to do with this data. So yeah, internet is great. It's great for social media. It's great for the retail. Um, but if you're looking for institutional grade um, success uh, you know, with your data and connectivity services, you have to go just that little bit further, just push that little bit extra, speak to companies like Avelicom and, uh, and you know, take inventory of what you are, um, what your latency is um, between these markets and uh, see if there's something to be done to improve it. Hope that answered the question. Thank you, Thank you Gabriel. Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy, you represent uh, a global player a player who works not on, only with uh, rubles but with other major currencies uh, and uh, work with different uh, uh, markets, uh, primary markets. Uh, in your opinion, how did they change uh, over last year? What about the prime market for rubles? Uh, did it change uh, in some direction and what is happening there at all? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, can I just apologize for the very bad cold that I have, so if I have to cough while I'm speaking, then uh, please forgive me for that. Um, I don't think we've seen significant change in the primary market in Ruble. Um, I think the course and uh, sources of price discovery haven't really changed. I know you're, uh, 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 I listened to your comments earlier about LMAX becoming a, a third um, place for price discovery in Ruble, and that would be very interesting to see whether that does indeed um, become the case over the next year or two. Um, however, I think in G10 markets, there have been really quite significant changes in the primary market structure. And a lot of them have gone sort of slightly under the radar. Uh, but I think that eventually they will have quite profound implications for our markets um, and for our market structure. Um, and probably the biggest single change is that we've seen is the shift from uh, cash markets to futures markets for the primacy of market data in a number of currency pairs. And I think that the number of pairs that that is impacting is likely to increase um, over the next um, you know, year to two years or so. Um, in particular, um, we've seen that um, pairs that are traditionally viewed as primary market Reuters, um, such as Aussie dollar, Canadian dollar, and sterling, um, have really shifted in terms of primary market status to the CME. And that's a really significant change for most EFX players within the market. Um, you know, when you started um, talking about things being quite boring in our markets, Evgeny, and I sort of couldn't agree more, especially given the state of global volatility, um, perhaps some of that might come back a little bit over the next few months. Um, uh, but, you know, there are really significant, I think, underlying changes, and these changes are, are, are potentially really quite profound for EFX players. So if you look, for example, at Canadian dollar, we did one brief study just on Canadian dollar where we noticed that, you know, the volumes on any normal day now in Canadian dollar are something between four and five X on the CME, what they are on uh, Reuters. And that's a really, really big change. Um, so a year ago, that numbers were probably one to one. And there was probably uh, roughly 50% of the volume happening on, on, on CME and 50% on Reuters. Now that is four to five times uh, the size. So what's happening on the CME is the vast majority of primary market volume. In addition, um, the spreads on the CME are tighter than the spreads on uh, Reuters. So, And that's true in not just one lot and not just 1 million, but also in 5 million. So we estimate that in um, 5 million of dollar Canada, you would expect to see something like a 25% tighter price um, for that size on uh, the CME now. <clears throat> this change is really quite significant because many of the global banks that are heavily involved in EFX are not especially specialized at trading on the CME. 
um, and they don't necessarily have direct market futures, got direct futures market connectivity, and they're not market makers onto the futures. There are one or two that do, but the vast majority do not, and the many um, do not have uh, you know, the adequate infrastructure, if you like, to trade on the CME. And that is very, very true once you get beyond perhaps the top five. And that has the, chart, the, the, the prospect, therefore, of creating that sort of data asymmetry, if you like, between the largest non-banks, who will obviously trade uh, extensively on the CME, maybe the top five or six global banks, and then everybody else. And that's really becoming, that could really have a very significant impact on the distribution of liquidity and, um, you know, market share amongst major players within the market. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it also has a massive change into, um, you know, the amount of market data that we see within the market. So one of the, the, the key uh, differentiators, if you like, of the CME versus the cash market is that the CME uh, operates on a real-time market data basis, whereas, of course, EBS and Reuters still operate on a five millisecond uh, basis, even with their ultra-fast data. So that means that the likely number of relevant price updates for any AFX player to have to handle are increased really very significantly. I wouldn't say exponentially, but not far off exponentially. Um, and that is going to put huge strain on the EFX infrastructures of a large number of you know, market participants and players. And that's happening at a time when revenues are, uh, let's say, lighter because yields are lower, because vol is lower. So you know, you've got the potential for a significant kind of confluence of events that will change the market structure quite dramatically. You know, and in addition, on that point on market data throughput, I think it's really, really important to understand that many of the platforms that we use to connect to clients uh, do not have the capability to handle the kind of market data throughput that we expect to be to see in the market over the next few years. And that is going to have a, a, a very significant impact on both those players and also potentially on customers. If I can't get a customer my latest price and I expect them to be trading on a, a latent price, then the only way I will be able to uh, accept that transaction is essentially if I show them a wider price. So the, 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 there is a direct correlation between the uh, experiences, if you will, of the end customer and the market data throughput within our markets and this change in primary market structure. Um, one final point on that, and then I will be quiet, <clears throat> is that um, in times of real crisis, um, the primary market has a tendency to shift from futures back to the cash markets. And we saw that very much, for example, during the height of the, the, the dollar shortage in the pandemic in March of last year. Um, and the market really went back to trading really large volumes on primary cash markets. Now, that's a concern for me, partly because what happens is the link between the primary cash markets and the CME um, is a futures link. It's a forwards link, essentially. Um, and there is this product CME link, which many of us will use. Um, and the liquidity from CME link in the crisis disappeared. And therefore, the homogeneity of the futures market and the cash market becomes an issue and becomes a significant problem for the sourcing of global liquidity. Um, in addition, primary markets moving to futures means that all kinds of other aspects of, of market structure come into play. The cash markets, for example, do not ever go limit down, whereas the futures market does, right? So there's the potential for there to be dislocation between futures and cash markets during times of crisis. And in the end, <clears throat> if the primacy of markets really moves to the CME or into futures more generally and away from spot and cash, then the infrastructure that people use to access the cash markets um, will atrophy and will become uh, you know, less, um, uh, less good. And that, again, during times of market crisis could become a significant issue. Um, with that, I'll just go offline and cough for a minute. Thank you, Jeremy. And in light of what you mentioned, uh, Gre Grigori, perhaps I can give you the floor as uh, so the uh, uh, price setting uh, 
venue, as a price setting platform. What did you do and what are you planning to do for the exchange uh, to keep it to keep its position as the primary market for the Russian uh, instruments and as the pricing point. Uh, we, as the uh, infrastructural institution, of course, uh, ourselves uh, do not trade uh, in algos, but our task and is uh, to provide uh, to the participants in uh, MOEX uh, trading uh, most comfortable and uh, accessible uh, mechanisms of uh, trading. Uh, for example, uh, for the FX market and also for the exchange market, we introduced uh, a service of uh, trading which uh, based uh, uh, quite strictly on the FIFO principle. We actually had concerns that uh, introducing FIFO uh, would be that uh, the winner would be the fastest uh, player and would uh, uh, then remain the only player in the market. And we may even lose uh, 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 on that uh, because of having only one player. However, it did not happen and uh, quite fortunately we now have uh, uh, really hundreds of um, uh, connections there and I asked my colleagues who are in uh, this uh, business of selling this service uh, what the situation was and uh, they said that uh, nobody from the those uh, initially connected uh, ever left and uh, of course, there's uh, some advantage uh, in uh, this uh, uh, trading principle. The thing is that if you have a fast algo and if you are the fastest one, then you win. However, even if you are lagging behind your competitors, you're kind of like uh, uh, position in this uh, line of execution uh, is quite predictable. And then you can have uh, some other smart technologies that uh, would not be purely based on the speed of execution. Now, what do we, we want to do next? Uh, this year, and we are very much, we started and we are very much close uh, to the publication of uh, market information uh, based on uh, simple binary encoding. And uh, looking forward, uh, it would really replace uh, our fast uh, protocol-based uh, uh, market data uh, publications. Uh, why did we do that? We want to really accelerate the publication of uh, market information and increase uh, its uh, uh, quality. And this is based on uh, two things. A simple binary encoding is uh, much more comfortable for programmers uh, to code uh, those messages uh, because this has uh, a fixed uh, uh, sequence of fields and a fixed length uh, which uh, can be processed uh, uh, by uh, SPGA-based uh, hardware. Also, this service uh, will be publishing uh, information on the uh, market events uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, fast uh, market data services can publish in one message uh, the summary of uh, one or even ten events if those happened uh, uh, quite fast. So this means that uh, many important things like uh, the appearance of a bid or a transaction won't be seen in this uh, fast-paced uh, uh, vehicle. Uh, the new service will provide you so this uh, granular data. The, uh, it is uh, like a zero latency in a market data publication in response to your request. Actually, it might be even some negative latency there. We are also moving towards uh, developing a trading service that will not be using any fixed uh, uh, protocols, but rather a simple binary encoding protocols. Uh, the same logic uh, is there as uh, it, it can be mastered uh, uh, much simpler and it is uh, faster. This is all done by our internal uh, teams of our trading system. So these will be the services of the trading core business. I also would like to say that uh, please do uh, come to us. So we're going to announce uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, integration of testing. It probably will happen sometime in mid-December. We're going to test that. Uh, so by the end of uh, summer, this would be probably available for the uh, market and uh, mid-September for the uh, trading ASB. Thank you, uh, Grigori. Another question that I had uh, for Jeremy again, and uh, as our global player, I have the suspicion, if you like, uh, that you, as the maker for many assets, uh, as the uh, player who works in uh, um, many uh, venues, uh, if not all of them, uh, do collect uh, uh, a lot of data. In your view, what are the trends? Uh, would the channels be okay, broad enough? Uh, would the throughput capacity be in line with the request? And what are the prospects of all of this? Uh, what can you share with us there? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, the trends in market data are, are, are sort of clear, right? The, the, the levels of market data, the amount of market data that's coming into the system across all asset classes is increasing and increasingly rapidly and increasing rap on a very rapid basis. Um, and <clears throat> there are sort of two different aspects to trading, really. One is um, utilizing the market data in a way to give you uh, a prediction of mid-price and future mid-price. And so we have a, uh, if you like, the big data problem that people outlined earlier, or the big data issue, I should say, rather than problem, but you know, issue that people outlined earlier, which is that you need to take in huge amounts of market data from uh, many, many different markets in order to see the relationships between all of that data. But of course, calculating anything around uh, those kind of correlations, et cetera, in real time is obviously virtually impossible. And doing that in any meaningful way to provide you uh, information for real-time trading is virtually impossible because of the requirements around latency uh, or lack of latency on trading real-time in markets. So you've got this kind of slightly um, uh, uh, separated or segregated model, one of which relates to how do you organize your data in such a way that you can do the research that you need to do, <clears throat> create the right inputs for all of your trading, et cetera, but then at the same time, have a uh, co-located uh, low latency trading engine, which takes the output of your research and implements it into the market microstructure. And the market microstructure is speeding up all of the time and continues to speed up all of the time. And that's partly what I was saying, for example, around the CME, you know, that move to real time market data, actually, even if EBS were to retain primary market status in things like Euro dollar and dollar yen, I cannot believe that it would be very long before EBS moved to real-time market data, especially given that, of course, it's owned by the CME. <clears throat> so the reality is we're faced with this kind of twin problem of uh, there being huge amounts of data driving all of our trading decisions and driving all of the uh, research that we do, et cetera. And then the market microstructure still requires us to have very, very fast trading technology um, and very, very fast kind of um, uh, uh, throughput handling of that data. And that data um, requirement means still means we have to have real co-location in almost all trading markets. The only market where I think that is not the case currently is actually in crypto, which uh, sort of Gabriel mentioned earlier on. And I think that's an interesting area where actually uh, I think you can use the cloud because of the way the exchanges are set up and because of the way the market is distributed um, around the cloud. So I think that's a very interesting area. And it'd be very interesting to see actually how that changes over time, you know, because we're moving from situations where the matching is not happening in a physical location. You know, this is not Aurora, Illinois. This is the cloud, right? And matching is often happening in the cloud. So there is a change there in, in the structure around uh, products like crypto. Now, whether that sort of change is then exported back into more traditional finance markets or traditional finance markets remain sort of with their physical location, we'll have to see. Um, but it's going to be very uh, interesting and quite challenging for market players because everybody is going to have to spend significant investment dollars um, to be able to continue to compete in our, in our markets electronically. And that's happening at a time when 
you know, as I said earlier, certainly trading in some products is revenue challenge because of sort of, you know, lack of volatility. And we can all take our view on, you know, whether vol is coming back to the market and, and central banks will stop printing money, um, you know, at some point in the 21st century. Thank you, Jeremy. What about infrastructure, uh, Grigori? What about MOAX infrastructure? Is it ready for this increase in the flow in the internal? What is the capacity of that? You mean increase the order, uh, the number of trade orders or what? Well, maybe also the number of instruments. Maybe it applies to the stock exchange because there's a domestic increase in terms of instruments. It uh, doesn't apply in the same way to FX. Or is it the same structure? Well, the structures are the same. Actually, we reached the peak level in August 2015. So far, we have not reached those uh, record figures, but the stock market is about 30 million orders every day, that's quite high, but in Airfix, because we've improved our infrastructure, and it's uh, now more predictable, we're seeing a uh, decline in the number of uh, applications uh, versus the record figures, but still it's millions, and we do uh, stress tests, some kind of capacity tests, and we don't see any issues. Whereas the user may say that everything is fine, everything works properly. And finally, one of the key items that's uh, often raised at uh, discussions, uh, platforms like this, where to invest? What's more appealing? And again, what is better, speed or logic? Maybe you can talk about today and going forward. Thank you, Vadim. I can talk about OTC. We're not a market maker at any plat public platform. So OTC-wise, actually we try to speed up our system, but uh, the uh, we're now faster than most of LPs. And we're just getting a huge number of rejects from everyone. This is why we had to introduce our internal speed bump, an algorithm that would diagnose the quote we have from the LP. Does it really show the provider's interest, or maybe it's just lagging behind a little bit? So the, those lagging quotes are uh, get filtered out. We just screen them so that we don't offend the LP or that we don't hit the wall of rejects ourselves. So we are in a situation where any further acceleration of the system doesn't really make sense. The only thing that makes sense is a smarter decision-making process. And I guess this is a win-win. We don't need to, at least in the OTC market, to invest further into our infrastructure in the amount like it's done by the funds that trade on MOIX or elsewhere. But it helps us to focus on a relationship and more long-term things like risk management, etc. So the future of OTC is not about getting to zero in terms of speed, but in order to take smarter decisions. Thank you. Jeremy, what is key for you, speed or the logic? Uh, logic, so smarter over faster. Um, however, what I would say is um, you have to have a certain level of speed in order to bring your logic to market and in order for your logic to pay off. So, you know, we're very much about research. We're very much about being smart. And if we work quick as well or, or, you know, have a certain level of speed, then we would be unable to really monetize the research and the logic that we, that we want to bring to bear in the market. So always better to be smarter. Smarter will drive your P&L long term, absolutely. But you have to reach a certain level of infrastructure 
in order to bring that that intelligence to bear. Um, and I think that's pretty clear actually within the market now. Thank you. Thank you. That was pretty straightforward. Thank you. Our time is up.